Father's Day. May I say Happy Father's Day? And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But it's also Juneteenth. Now, I don't know if um, you really understand what Juneteenth is or not, but I thought maybe just a couple of uh, a couple words about it because it's quite an interesting day, to say the least. The end of slavery for the Emancipation Proclamation happened in 1863. In um, June 19th, in 1865, two years after that moment, a Major General uh, Granger shows up in Galveston, Texas, and he walks in and he frees the slaves. Now, what happened in those two years? There is kind of uncertain, but it's kind of interesting. They said that the possibly a courier got stopped. Possibly the owners of the slaves didn't want anybody to know what happened. But also what's probably happened was that Texas was a Confederate state, so they held out as long as they could. But anyways, the major, uh, the major ranger shows up, and there was this tremendous celebration. And um, so that's what this day really represents, is to remember that emancipation, if you will, for not only just the ones that are in Texas, but across the world, that slavery was still pretty strong up to that point. And, um, and then what I thought was interesting is I read, a, it was a first-hand account of a former slave, his name was Felix Hayward. And he said, we were all just walking on golden clouds. What a great moment of that. If you think about those words. He said, everyone went wild. We were free. Just like that, we were free. We can't quite understand that. But if we think about 1776, where the nation decided we don't want that oppression, we want to be free. Here was a whole group of people that were Innocent people taken away from their home, their homes, their livelihoods, their families, and forced to be slaves for a long time. And all of a sudden, they were free. So I hope you understand why this is such a celebration of the day. And it's a celebration because of this country also that we finally are looking at. We're all free. We're all free. And this whole world should be set free. And through all of that, we had fathers. We had mothers. Last month, last month, we celebrated Mother's Day. Now we're going to celebrate Father's Day. And um, it is a, a lot of people kind of turn up their noses and say, well, it's again another day just to Hallmark and sell a bunch of cards. <laughs> but it is deeper than that. And Brian found a really neat little video that we're going to show in just a minute. But I also found a little prayer or poem that was written, and this poem is done by someone anonymous, no one knows who wrote this. But I just thought it really, really kind of strikes the right chord within Amen. this church today. It said, God took the strength of a mountain, he took the majesty of a tree, he took the warmth of the summer sun and the calm of a quiet sea. He took the generous soul of nature and the comforting arm of night the wisdom of the ages and the power of the eagle's flight. The joy of a morning in, a joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a musket seed, the patience of eternity and the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities when there was nothing more to add. He knew, and he knew his masterpiece was complete. And so he called it Dad. And that's nice. Moms are there for nurturing. Yeah. And no one can nurture better than moms. The dads are some of that strength that we all live through and gain. And um, so thank you all dads. Whether you're a biological dad or a mentor dad, what you do in being around others means the world. We have the video. A celebration for honoring our fathers and celebrating fatherhood. So, who invented 
far this day. There are few individuals credited for that honor, but most historians consider Sonora Dodd a woman from Washington State in 1910. One fine Sunday, while the church minister is giving a sermon about the recently added Mother's Day, Sonora Dodd recommended him that there should be a Father's Day. She suggested that the date would be June 5th, her father's birthday. But who is Sonora's father? William Smart, a Civil War veteran, spent his life raising all his children as a single parent, the fact that Sonora's mother died after giving birth to her sixth child. When Sonora was married and had her own kids, she realized what a huge activity her dad had done raising their family alone. So why is it not celebrated on the 5th of June? The church minister needed more time to set up the sermon, so he moved the date to June 19th, the third Sunday of the month. One of the earliest set up to observe Father's Day was to wear a flower. Red rose if your father is still living. White rose if your father is already deceased later giving fathers cards, gifts, or any special activity for the day. To campaign Father's Day, God asked help from manufacturers of men's product and other people who make profit from the celebration, such as creators of ties, tobacco pipes, and different items that would best fit as present for fathers. The reason why the public still resisted the idea of Father's Day. Numerous Americans trusted an official Father's Day would be simply one more path for retailers to profit since of Mother's Day helped the sale of presents for moms. As early as 1913, bills had been submitted to Congress to recognize Father's Day nationally. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson pushed to make Father's Day official, but couldn't muster enough support from Congress. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge would also recommend that Father's Day be observed, but did not go so far as to issue a national proclamation. In 1957, Margaret Chase Smith, a senator from Maine, wrote a proposal that accused Congress of ignoring fathers for 40 years while only honoring mothers. It wasn't until 1966 that President Lyndon Johnson finally signed a presidential proclamation that made the third Sunday of June Father's Day. In 1972, President Richard Nixon made Father's Day a permanent national holiday. Today, Father's Day is celebrated all over the world. The officially recognized date of Father's Day varies from country to country. Some countries are celebrating it in March, some in May, and most countries are still celebrating it by the third Sunday of June. Some countries are celebrating the International Men's Day for those who are not yet fathers. But anyway, thanks to Sonora's love for her father, for giving our fathers a special day. My adversaries taunt me as if crushing my bones all day long. 
they say to me, where is your God? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Vindicate me, God, and champion my cause against the unfaithful nation. Rescue me from the deceitful and the unjust person. For you are the God of my refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? Send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then I will come to the altar of God, to God my greatest joy. I will praise you with the water, God my God. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Word of the Lord. I have a couple of prayer requests. Um, the first one, Summer put in for Alice Baker, who's going to have a knee replacement on Wednesday. So we're going to have prayers for Alice for a speedy recovery. Then I ask for prayers for, for Dale's daughter, T who's in Florida and is having trouble with uh, gallbladder problems. And then also for the family of Harold Harper, who died this past week. Are there any other prayer requests? Uh, Trudy Schmidt, she has cancer. Schmidt? Schmidt, yeah. She is to sell t-shirts. Okay. Are there any other? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, today we ask for blessings for our fathers. We ask you to guide them to be good role models and loving to their children. Give them grace and patience to handle all situations in a loving and caring way. We ask for comfort for those whose fathers are no longer with us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your wisdom and mm -hmm. your caring and your love and your guidance. We are so thankful for your presence. We know you are always with us. Help us to turn to you with our needs. We pray today for those who have been affected by the storms of this past week, those who are still without power, and those who have sustained damage. Comfort those who are suffering. Minister to the needs of the mind, body, and spirit. We thank you, Lord, with this church family. We are so blessed with caring and loving members and friends. We now pray for those who need your healing power and loving touch. We pray for Alice, for T, and the family of Harold Harper and Trudy Schmidt. Be with our shut-ins and those unable to attend our services. Be with those who are traveling. And hear now those unspoken prayers deep in our hearts. Lastly, Father, give us this trust in your purpose for us that we measure out our lives not by what we have done or failed to do, but by our faithfulness to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. You taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
And I think the best thing to do at this moment is just to uh, take a few moments, make everything right with you and our loving God, and then we'll sing our communion hymn, and then we will come together. So let's take a few moments, and then we will sing our hymn.
For I received from the Lord what I now hand on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And then he said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took a cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. As we continue our journey through the book of Acts, the scripture that I chose, Acts 7, 50, 7 uh, starting in verse 55 through 60, and then the first couple of three verses of chapter 8, is actually it's about the very first recorded part of the Christian, the one who believes in Christ. His name is Stephen. However, if we just read those verses, those very few verses, we're going to miss out on a lot of things that happened that caused this, uh, this brutal attack upon Stephen. And even more importantly, we may miss the very profound message that God is trying to give us in this situation. It's a promise that there is abundant life through faith in Jesus Christ. But that promise comes with price. And sometimes that price is um, a very heavy price. Our story actually begins in chapter 6. In the early days of the church, the numbers were growing daily. And what happens is the care for those that are needing extra help is becoming a burden. There's, uh, so what happens is the believers start pooling their resources. And they shared in their common wealth. And isn't that interesting what we do even today? That's what happened in that little tray that uh, when you put it in the bag back there. We're sharing our resources with those that need help. Now high on this priority list was uh, to provide help for the widows and the orphans. Those are exactly what Jesus' words are. Food was distributed on a daily basis, which ultimately, though, led to problems. Some were getting more than others. You hear something going on there? There were squabbles between groups, and it breaks out all through these new years. And it disrupts the apostles because they're trying to move the church forward, and all they're doing is having to deal with these problems that are erupting. Now, I have to say, Sue was in on this too, and along with Dami and myself down at the pump house, we had a food pantry. And it was wonderful to help people the way we did. But it was interesting. A couple things happened. Sometimes people were angry because they didn't have brand on the shelves that they wanted. 
or they wanted five instead of one. Um, but also on the other side of that, there are so many food pantries given through this whole county, especially within the city, that everything should have been pooled together for one place for people to go to. But what happens is nobody would do that. We would talk to try to get everybody to go to one place and everybody gets served in a proper and appropriate way. But we have churches, uh, and nothing wrong with this, but there was a little church in Jeromesville that um, everybody brought food to every Sunday. They put it in bags and then they walked up and down the streets after church service and just took bags to the next house, the next house, the next house. Until finally one person walked into this house for the home mm -hmm. time and all of the bags of food were still sitting in the dining room and the kitchen because the people didn't like it or needed it or they didn't like what was given. So, see, it's not uncommon that these situations, when we think we're doing something right, can be taken advantage of. So in order to relieve some of the situations that, the, that was happening to the apostles, they decided to call on seven men of good standing, and as uh, Luke says, full of the Spirit of God. And they're here to take over the responsibility of distributing the food. Stephen was happens to be one of the chosen. Now Luke describes Stephen as a man of full of God's grace and power. Those are pretty powerful words when you think about it. In other words, Stephen was especially gifted. Gifted, we're going to look at that word for a few seconds too. He stood out from all of the others. But I need to say this, if you look at the list, and I hope you go back and read through chapter 6 and 7, the second name on the list was Philip. And Philip basically takes the place of Stephen, and he goes out um, and ministers to many. So this list was not um, it's not just Stephen. Everybody on that list did some wonderful things. But Stephen was one of those people who his mind and heart were always at ease. Through any kind of situation, quite honestly. Someone who's not easily flustered, he goes through life with uh, grace and dignity, he always has a smile on his face. I think we all know someone like that. In fact, we could almost say that often our fathers were that way. <laughs> Someone who's always uh, on time, prepared. <laughs> Someone who has a solution when things go a little wonky. That was Stephen. Though God's grace, he shows great promise. He was filled with the gift of service. And he and others that were chosen, those seven, they were to distribute food, care for the widows and orphans, but they were also to care for the poor, the lame, the infirm, and even the dying. So I said we'd talk about gifts for a moment. Gifts. We all have them. Remember we used to take those, those uh, tests, we'd have to sit down and fill out all those things, and then this is what everybody's test for, you know, their, their gift. This is the gift that you get, and then nobody did anything with it, it seemed like. But we always filled out those things to figure out what our gifts are. But Paul tells the people, tells us what our gifts really are in 1 Corinthians. He says, um, you have gifts of wisdom, hospitality, knowledge, faith, healing, preaching, teaching, all of those things. The point is, whatever your gift is, that gift comes from God. We need to understand that. And our gifts are to be used for the common good and not kept to ourselves. And our responsibility is to use our gifts faithfully in the service of others. Sadly, we live in a world that's kind of lost that whole attitude. Sharing and helping others um, isn't really on the agenda anymore. It's, uh, we're taught that you can grab everything that you can, you can keep everything that you have, and the more you have, the better, right? In other words, it's all about me. You see, Christianity is all about someone else. That may be how the world sees life, but it isn't how God sees it. No, it's not even how God wants it to be. Our lives of abundance through Jesus comes only by our service to others. And here's the part of our self-denial. We, we don't like that word too much either. And uh, that's totally contrary to what the world says. Now, to other early Christians, uh, they recognized these qualities in Stephen. And they chose him to be a deacon also. 
Stephen rises to the occasion and becomes a leader, and he loses himself in the service to others. It's a clear lesson for us even today. We're supposed to be able to do those things, right? Lose yourself in helping others. Now, not only does Stephen help distribute food, but Luke writes that Stephen did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. They, they don't list what those things were, but can you imagine what this Stephen, full of spirit, was doing? Healing, possibly healing physically, healing spiritually, giving people hope. Not only fellow Christians, but Jews from all around the Mediterranean are starting to recognize this Stephen. There are Cyrenians, as we list in the book here, Alexandrians, that's from all over in Egypt, are starting to recognize who this Stephen is. There's, there are people from um, Cilicia and even Asia. So you see everything from west to east and even north are all starting to recognize this Stephen. But there was one group in particular. It was a radical group called the Synagogue of the Freedmen. Now, that's kind of interesting. Um, there, there's speculation as to what these freedmen were. Were Jewish people who were either slaves or had been abducted and they've come back. They're, they're putting together their own group, but they want everything like it was way back when, before they became slaves. And Stephen is in here upsetting those ideas that they want to have back. So what happens is between this group and with Stephen, especially a fiery dispute comes out, and uh, it's all over worship, temple rites, long-held traditions. But because Stephen was so well-versed in the Torah and the Jewish history, as well as the story of Jesus and this new church that's being founded, they were no match to Stephen. He won every argument with them. And Luke writes these words in chapter 6. They could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. So what did these three men do? They did exactly what the priests did against Jesus. They secretly persuaded men to lie and to say that we have heard him speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So you see, they stirred up the crowd. And they even stirred up the elders and the teachers. Now, if Stephen hadn't been so gifted, possibly he would have uh, never been noticed. He just kept right on going. Maybe he might have been, should have been a little less spoken out. Maybe he had never been, a, uh, never been a threat to anybody if he would have been a little less. Many of us just want to uh, not make waves, maybe get along, right? We're all kind of that. We want to stay under the radar, stay away from quarrels, stay away from conflicts, you know, live and let live, live long and prosper. But Stephen would have never made a difference. He would have never fulfilled God's will and God's purpose in life. And if he had stayed. I once heard someone say that the quickest way to meet the devil is to stand up for God. And uh, I think we all can shake our heads at that. That's absolutely right. As long as we're willing to go along with the status quo, blend in with the world, the devil is going to leave us alone. We wouldn't even be a threat. However, speak up, take a stand, be a witness to the truth of God's word. That's when attacks start coming down on us. Every conceivable direction we can be attacked. Opponents will try to pull us down. We could even be excluded by our own families, our friends, dismissed as being one of them. Stephen stood up and he stood his ground. And when the freedmen couldn't win an honest debate with him, they decided to play dirty. So armed with their lies and trumped up charges, they seized Stephen, and guess what? They brought him before the Sanhedrin, the highest court in Jewish life. Stephen is now on trial for his very life, but it doesn't seem to face him at all. As one false witness after another testifies against him, Jesus sits perfectly still and he's calm. He's at peace. In fact, Luke tells us all in the Sanhedrin looked at Stephen and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. You see, being persecuted, but he's at peace. 
reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. We read the Beatitudes all the time, but here's the Beatitude in action. Blessed are you who, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me being Jesus. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward. Not here, but in heaven. Mm -hmm. See how that's perfect in this situation. You see, we need to understand there's unlimited blessings in store for anyone willing to speak God's word of love and truth to the world. The question we each need to ask ourselves, though, is this. If I was on trial for being a Christian, would I be found guilty? Or would there not be enough evidence to convict? Ouch. Do our lives, our own lives here, reflect Jesus or reflect the ways of the world? Stephen was a pillar of virtue. He talked the talk, but he also walked the walk. As a result, though, he ended up with a huge bullseye on his back. And in the eyes of the Jewish leaders, he was guilty. Now, we, we need to understand what's going on here. Jesus was in front of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin often. They were riled by him until finally, after three years, they put him to death, thinking that they closed it down. Three days later, he rises, and it all starts over again with even larger, stronger men. And then all of a sudden, they take those men and they arrest them, and they tell them to be quiet, and then they let them loose, and then they keep talking again, and they tell them to be quiet again, and they beat them, and it just keeps going and building. You see what's happening here? This isn't an incident. This is something that's been building for a long time. And every time they try to snuff it out, it builds even stronger. They're fuming. But now it's Stephen's turn to answer all the charges. However, Stephen says not one word of his defense. Instead of being, um, he begins listening to some wonderful words in the ministry of what God does. He starts with the covenant of Abraham and the, prophet and the promise of a great nation. Then how God used Joseph to save the people from starvation and how people of Israel became slaves in Egypt and the deliverance as Moses led them in the promised land. Then he spoke of the great days of King David, his son, King Solomon, and the very building of the temple of the Lord, which they're at. And I think it's interesting. This is exactly later, which we'll look at later, how Paul always starts his arguments with when he's in prison. He always goes back and he reminds people who they are and where they've come from and who they should be and who they should be. That, what I said was Acts chapter 7, 1 through 50, and I also say go back and read those so you can catch up on this, to read everything that Stephen is saying. Now it seems to this point all is going well, but then verse 15, uh, 51 it happens. Stephen goes from preaching to blaming. He goes from a defense to flaming accusations. He points his fingers at the leaders and listen to what he says. He said, you stiff-necked people. They've heard that one a number of times. And that really starts to crank up that, that, that heat. He says, you're all circumcised, uncircumcised in heart and in ears. You're always resisting the Holy Spirit. And then he says, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets didn't your fathers persecute? You get that? He's basically telling them, you took every prophet and killed them. He said, they killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you too have become betrayers and murderers. You received the law that was ordained by angels, but you haven't obeyed it. Wow. Talk about instigating a riot. I mean, think about those words. These are the leaders of the church. Luke tells us that when Stephen finished speaking, the leaders were cut to the heart, and they were furious. No surprise here. 
What else could Stephen expect after accusing them of betraying and murdering Jesus, the very Son of God, the promised Messiah? So in Acts 7.55, finally we get to our scripture for the day. Luke tells us that being filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen looked up into heaven and he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he says those words to the San Peter. Standing in the very presence of God. How dare he say those words? If you're in the presence of God, you don't even look. You're on your face, your hands down. And he said, I see Jesus standing at the very side of God. Oh. With that, the leaders were pushed right over the edge. They'd cry out at the top of their lungs. They plug their ears, which I think is an interesting thing of saying that too. And then they dragged Stephen out to the temple. They took him beyond the city walls and they stoned him to death. And that's what those six verses were all about. But as he was being stoned, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit with smiles. And then falling on his knees, he cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I don't know if you notice anything here, but there's quite a similarity. Jesus started with arguments. Same way. He was arrested, so was Stephen. He is before the Sanhedrin, so is Stephen. He was silent, so was Stephen. He was calm, so was Stephen. He didn't fight back, neither did he. And then they were both put to death. And they both said, receive my spirit. And they both said, don't hold them accountable for my death. And then they both breathed their lives. You see, it was pointed out to me, Stephen was slated to go through these things for us. This story gives us some really harsh things to think about, though. Can the things that we believe still provoke others to violence? We'll just look around us. There's uh, people being shot in churches now. That happened just a few days ago where Betsy was down in Birmingham. So if these things still do happen, are we to continue to speak out? Or should we just be silent and maybe not make waves? What should we do? In order, maybe we should just um, hope that we can fight another day. See, those things, we don't know where to go, do we? How do we know? Do we stand? Do we fight? Or do we run? Sorry to say, in 2,000 years later, people are scorned, ridiculed, beaten, and yes, even put to death for even just mentioning the word Jesus. I get um, a, a newsletter at least once a week, sometimes twice. It's called The Voice of the Martyrs. And one of the stories, and it's stories all the time, all around the world, of people who speak up for Jesus. This one really touched me, though. It was a, a, an elderly gentleman who was in his late 60s. He's had a little motorbike for the last 30 years. He's got a little wooden box in the back. And he gets Bibles from Voice of the Martyrs. They send the little, little bitty pocket Bibles. In the, and he's in uh, Colombia. He fills the box and he rides his motorcycle into the jungles. And he goes from village to village to village. And right through the middle of the drug cartels, too. And many times he has been beaten, put into the hospital. His family won't even talk to him. He has no friends except the ones that he makes in these little villages as he goes from village to village passing out Bibles. He has not stopped doing it for 30 years. He, he, all of the things he's been through. But his faith is stronger every day because of those things. You see, sometimes we are so fortunate living in this country. We don't see the sacrifices that are being made around the world in Christ's name. But we need to know that each and every one of us, at some time or other, we're all going to have to choose, aren't we? To either speak to, of the injustice or to remain silent. To stand with Jesus or to run away. 
Stephen knew it was his time. He knew for a fact that it was his time. Now, this story, though, I don't want you to, to, to understand. I don't want you to think, oh, golly, the only way I can be a Christian is die, <laughs> like Stephen. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with us having to die in the name of Christ. We may never be called to give up everything we have, but we might. But we are called to stand. But we'll also know, and the, the, and the way we'll know these things is, one, knowing this book, knowing what Jesus is telling us in this book, um, keeping it and knowing that the Spirit will direct us where he wants us to go. The Spirit directed Stephen there, the Spirit will direct us wherever He wants us to go. But we need to understand where to go and when it speaks to us. Mm -hmm. This book will always help you with that. And then, I'm going to one more story. A week ago, Friday, we uh, hosted the uh, Ministerial Association's meeting here. And um, we had 30, 35 pastors here in the church and had a great meeting. One of the gentlemen that walked in, his name was Manassas. He's from... Uh, Nigeria. In the 90s, he was here at the seminary, and he actually came here to this church back then, and he worshipped here for a while. So he was amazed to walk in and see everything that's changed, but he just came back again from Nigeria. Why? He's a preacher. He's been preaching in Nigeria. The, um, the bad people are coming in through Africa now very very strong. And he sent his family over here about four or five months ago. But it's gotten so bad over there that he finally had to leave himself. He's going to go back. And he's already been run out of his country once, and he's got to go back. So you see, we don't have to die the way Stevens did. That's, that's my point. He knows. He knew it was time that he had to leave because he has more to say. And then standing out there in our little gathering room, speaking with him, it just filled with pride of what he said and what he was doing. So you and I are like Stephen, though. We just have to understand what God wants of us. We need to understand that our lives are never to be about ourselves. As believers, we're to help others. We're to help the poor, the needy, the widows, the orphans to pass on God's word to others, and to stand up against all injustice, regardless of our age, regardless of our personal fears, regardless of our own pains, because we do all of this through the love of Jesus. There's a little addendum. Chapter 8 of Acts starts off and Saul was there, giving approval to Stephen's death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, and they mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Why would I read those? You see, we never know the outcome of the situations that we're in. We can all sit here and go, oh, poor Stephen, he's dead. It's over. But God always uses things. Always. Sometimes God uses the most harsh moments to bring about good. Saul is standing, holding the cloaks of the men that are actually killing Stephen, and he's smiling. But as Stephen dies, there's a persecution of all believers breaks out that day, and Saul is the one who starts it. Now, when that happens, I notice, I hope you heard what I said. The scattering of people went to Judea and Samaria. Isn't that what Jesus said? We're going to go from Judea to Samaria. The word is spreading through these, this heinous act. Saul is standing there. He's going door to door, a 
arresting people, throwing them in prison. Because of Stephen's death, though, the word is spreading. And one of the most feared Pharisee of all, Saul of Tarsus, he becomes in a very short time the greatest champion of Christianity, Paul. Mm -hmm. So never fear what God puts in front of you. Because our loving God uses all the situations for his good. So we do. Amen. Amen. If you're able to stand, if you'd like to join us in our ending, our closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. How cool.